I have compiled eight easy blues heads. I'm calling this video easy blues heads. What I mean by that is that they're easy to learn. If you want to play them like Kenny Burrell or Grant Green, that's just as hard as anything else, but they're easy to learn. So if you are somewhat new to jazz improvisation, these are great. And I'm going to talk about that, why this is the right place to begin, the right place to start with jazz improvisation. If you are more of a seasoned player, experienced player, it's always good to go back to the basics. Sometimes we get caught up in the code frame matrices and the alter scales and all that. Then it's kind of good to put that aside for a while and just work on the something that just sounds and feels good. And also, I know a lot of you are, like me, teaching. These are great for teaching. So I have made a video in the past called Jazz Blues and you should watch that if you haven't. Uh, together with this lesson, then you're going to get a lot of information about jazz blues if you watch both of these videos. So in that video, I play this tune as well. I go over some heads in that video as well. This is Blues in the Closet by Oscar Pettiford, which is a bass player. So it's, uh, I think on the original recording, the melody is played by the bass, which is already unusual. <laughs> I just love this riff. It's really cool. Just try to play them with a metronome on beat two and four and try to make it swing. This is a swing feel on this too. There's a harmony. Sometimes. So you want to make sure that we understand the difference between a regular blues form and a jazz blues form. So this is a jazz blues, so meaning we go G to C. Back to G, right? E, A minor, D7. And here you can play a turnaround. A regular blues is just going from G to C and back to G. D, that's a blues, a 12 bar blues. You all, all know this. We just use those terms to kind of separate things. So a blues is a 12 bar blues. It's just that. And then there's a jazz blues where you add the two five or you change the last chords to a two five and you add the dominant to the two chord. Not always, but most of the time. Then there's something called bebop blues. There's bird blues. So these are just terms. So the labels, so we can know what we're talking about. Sometimes like blues players will play a jazz blues and sometimes jazz players will play a blues. But most of the time you find this chord progression in jazz. And this tune, you could, you could a lot of these heads, you could play either as a blues blues or a jazz blues. This one works great as a regular 12 bar blues. I call them blues blues to separate jazz blues, blues blues. You also learn from this that this major third on the G and 
for the C7, you have to change that to a B flat. So it's almost easier, instead of thinking G mixo to C mixo, it's almost easier to think G major to G minor. It's kind of like this tune, right? Baby Elephant Walk. That tune shows you, like, it really demonstrates that major to minor. So that's how I think about it, like major kind of to minor, rather than mixolydian, mixolydian, mixolydian. But you should be able to think like that too, of course. So this tune has been recorded by Bud Powell, a really famous, great version. But I want you to listen to Tal Farlow's version. So I'm gonna make a playlist, but I'm not gonna play these recordings because when I do that, I always get in trouble with YouTube algorithms. So I'm not gonna play the actual recordings. I'm not even gonna put the playlist that I made in the description because I do that and I also get in trouble with the algorithms, copyright algorithms. I do, however, put that playlist on my Patreon page. But you can find these tunes on whatever streaming service you're using. So I want you to listen to Tal Farlow and just play along with that to get the feel for this, uh, how you should play this head. That's the point of this. We're trying to improve our jazz feel. I, sometimes people ask me, how do you get a good swing feel? One way to do that is to play along with a lot of recordings. That's not the only thing you have to do, but that's one place to begin, kind of. If you can play along with Tal Farlow when he plays this simple melody and make it sound like him, then uh, that's a good place to start. There's also like a shout chorus that happens after the solos on the Tal Farlow recording, which is really cool. The next head I've also talked about a lot of times, Sunny Moon for two. Let's change to B flat. This melody, you can also play like jazz blues or blues blues, but we'll play it as a jazz blues in B flat. So I'm gonna play like a Charleston rhythm. This is a very easy tune in a way that it's only the pentatonic scale or the... So the point here is not to make an exact rhythmic transcription of what they play on the original recording or anything like that. I want you to look at these PDFs that I made as uh, uh, just a sketch. You have to listen to how they're phrasing and I don't see the point in trying to do, ex write everything down exactly as it is. It's better in this kind of music to leave it open for your interpretation. But also what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture what famous players do with this melody. Some of you might say, well, this is not how it's supposed to be played. You've heard a different version, but See how I'm kind of pulling some of these phrases? That's kind of the trick. That's what you want to be able to do. That's what you do in this style of music. So you're not just playing it. You have to play it with like some kind of swing feel.
So try to play the melody and maybe improvise and use the metronome on beat two and four, as I said, and just play the melody over and over and then try to add some chord stabs and little blues phrases. So here I want you to listen to Grant Green when he plays this amazing recording of him playing Sonny Moon for two, which is by Sonny Rollins, right? And I think he plays like this. Not sure about that, but it sounds like he's doing that. Which is really weird. That's the flat nine. That's, I remember a teacher I had, he was talking about that, that sometimes they do that flat nine. Could, you could, that could be a blue note as well. We all know this note, which is kind of a dissonant note, right? It's outside of the scale, but that's the magic blues. But you can also do, it's that uh, in this tune, right? flat nine. So blues is a mysterious thing. The way I look at it is in, when you play jazz, there are different type of harmonic context. It could be a major or minor, like diatonic tunes. But then there's blues harmony. And sometimes these days it could be non-functional harmony or even uh, atonal music or so-called free harmony but the blues aspects it's what's kind of separates it from classical music and it's harder to kind of describe with theory you have to kind of listen to blues or play blues it's it's more mysterious so this uh, sunny moon for two could be played at with the both again as a regular blues or a jazz blues and you could play with different fields doesn't have to be a swing field could even be a Latin thing. So while we're on the topic of Grant Green, next tune is number one, Green Street. And this, uh, here I wrote down the melody kind of in a very sketchy manner. You have to listen to what he's doing, but I, that's, that's my point. I want you to do that. I want you to listen and figure out, but this is just kind of to give you an idea. Again, it's a jazz blues in B flat. <laughs> So here I'm kind of trying to use the loop pedal levels in the best demonstration, but I don't want you to use iReal Pro for this. You know how I talk about iReal Pro, the app, all the time. Because here we're working on time feel. So the time feel, the swing feel in iReal Pro is terrible. So don't get me wrong, I love iReal Pro. It's an amazing app, but I don't want you to use it here. What I want you to do is to play along with the recording then find a tempo, set a tempo on two or four, a metronome on two and four, play without the recording, go back and play with the recording, listen closely, and then ultimately you wanna try to make it sound like you're playing like they do on the recording. So here, I think he's playing something like, 
maybe he's doing something like that. I'm not sure what he's doing, to be honest. And again, it's not the, necessarily the point to try to figure out exactly what they're doing, but you aim for kind of that. So paying attention to the details in the phrasing and the timing, how they're kind of pulling the timing or stretching the timing and where you put the emphasis on what notes, usually the upbeats, right? So that's kind of where the magic happens. It's where you put the certain notes, you highlight certain notes, you play them. It adds another dimension to the music. But that's kind of your job to be able to do that. You can't really notate that. Well, I guess you could, but it's hard to put that kind of aspect into theory. So Grant Green is one of the best players to begin with. I discovered Grant Green late. I remember my brother was listening, and he's not a musician. He was listening to that, and I was like, what is that? That's Grant Green. I've like never heard of him. And at this point, I've been playing jazz for years. Never heard of him. And I wish that somebody had told me early on. Grant Green, when he plays standards, and then Kenny Burrell. We're going to come to that next. Those two guitar players is the best place to begin. And I'm not saying that to diminish them because I love those players. Just because what they're doing in a way it's simple doesn't mean that it's uh, not as good as, you know, Frank Gambale or something like that. It's just like it's easy to understand what they're doing. Whereas if you try to figure out what Alan Holsworth is doing, it's very complicated, right? Like you have to know how they kind of, <clears throat> you have to figure out the secret of what they're doing. And it's not a good place to start. So that doesn't mean that Alan Holsworth is better than Grant Green, in my opinion, or vice versa. It's just different. But Grant Green doesn't do anything esoteric. He doesn't do anything weird, like strange tunings or different extended techniques or anything. It's just straightforward guitar playing. It's not super technical. So that's why it's easier to learn. But if you want to play it with the same kind of amazing feel that he has, then that is just as difficult as anything else, in my opinion. Here's another good beginner tune, Sweet Alice Blues. The Sweet Alice Blues by George Benson. That's another good place to start, even though George Benson played some stuff that is extremely technical and nobody can play that stuff. But he also played, especially in the beginning, some kind of easier stuff, like this tune. Here we have more of a boogaloo feel. So here we have more of a boogaloo feel and there's a regular blues, a standard blues, 12 bar blues. This uh, melody doesn't really work that well for a jazz blues, I don't think. So here you notice that I'm almost playing like a clave in the comping. So that's like a boogaloo clave, I guess you could call it. It's not always jazz swing when you play jazz. So one of the arguments I want to make with this video is that when you try to learn to play jazz, this often happens, right? You come from, if you're a guitar player, you come from a background of playing rock and blues and you know how to play blues 
more or less, but not in this style. You know how to play like Clapton and Jeff Beck, perhaps those kind of blues licks, Jimmy Page. And again, there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's those, all those players I just mentioned are amazing, but this is not how you play jazz. If you try to play like that in jazz, it doesn't really work, even though you can do it in fusion and some jazz players have been able to kind of incorporate that kind of playing in their jazz playing, like Scott Henderson, Mike Stern, even John Schofield, I guess. You can hear some of that like standard blues guitar vocabulary in a jazz context. But if you try to play those kind of blues licks over Stella by Starlight, usually that doesn't work. But this is the same, same, same notes. It's just phrased differently on a same instrument. But if you play like George Benson does over Sweet Alice Blues, that works over Stella by Starlight too. So what happens is you come to the lesson, right? With, and you know how to play a few blues licks and you say, I want to learn jazz. And the teacher gives you these tunes. <laughs> some other Charlie Parker blues head and this is blues but the step from how you play Eric Clapton plays over a blues and how Charlie Parker plays over a blues like that I, that that's tenor madness by the way or even weirder like it's too big of a leap for most people so Again, I'm not saying don't study Charlie Parker because that's very, very important to understand what is happening there. But for a guitar player, it doesn't make sense. That's what I meant before. I wish somebody had showed me Grant Green or Kenny Burrell because that makes sense for me as a guitar player. And then you go on and study the Charlie Parker stuff. But this is where you should begin. Another point I want to make is that understanding this kind of rhythm And how to phrase that's more important than knowing oh it's a mixolydian flat seven or lydian flat seven and altered blah 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 understanding the rhythm and is it swung or is it straight or is it somewhere between right you know it, it, it's a whole spectrum. Swing is a spectrum. It's like it's swung or it's straight or everything in between. And that's the kind of stuff that mus real musicians pay attention to, in my opinion, like professional musicians. That's what they focus on when they try to learn a tune that they're going to play. It, where is the groove? How do you create that feel? Nobody talks about like what scale are you using on this chord. So. Again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't practice scales, but that's just theory. That's like practicing grammar when you're learning a language. Ultimately, you need to have something to say and say something so that people can relate to it. So and then at the end of the day, grammar doesn't matter if you have nothing to say. If you want to become a great jazz player with a great feel, you have to understand the, that aspect, that, that dimension of music as well as the harmony. So let's move on to the next one, which is a more the bluesiest of them all. Back at the Chicken Shack, that's by Jimmy Smith. So here we have a shuffle. This is gonna be a, a like a shuffle, normal blues form in F.
Sorry, I digress. I love playing this stuff. So here, there are many different versions of this tune as well. And then the, the sax is playing the melody a little bit different because the saxophone can only play one note, right? So one of the problems with the students, beginner students, or but they can play, but they're new to jazz, is that they don't know how to outline chords and uh, they just play the blues scale, but if you remove the background, you wouldn't hear where they are. So they, they haven't figured out how to outline chords yet. And here, you hear the chords, right? And so this tune can help the student to figure that out. And here again, some people play major, or is it minor? somewhere in between I don't know so you should be able to play this with a great kind of shuffle feel So you might say, well, this is not jazz, it's blues. But sometimes you play like this in a jazz context as well. And Jimmy Smith is kind of one of those players that are in between jazz and blues, right? But this is also something that somebody like Joey Francesco would play, and he's a jazz musician. I think there is actually a recording of him, Joey Fra De Francesco, playing this tune with uh, Steve Gadd, and it's unbelievable the way they swing. Holy moly. Moving on. Midnight Creeper. This is not by a guitar player. It's by Louis Lou Donaldson. But um, that's George Benson on this recording. The album is called Midnight Creeper. So this is another one of those boogaloo kind of grooves. <laughs> So I think those notes at the end should be more major. Sounds like the, what is that? It's, uh, Quincy Jones, right? A lot of tunes in from the 60s, I'm not sure if it's from the 60s, I'm guessing this is from the 60s, have this kind of feel to it that seem to be a popular thing. It makes me think of the kind of Austin Powers movies, right? One very interesting thing about this is that you know how I said earlier that it's major minor, so major. But here it's minor. But we're still on the C7, right? Like that next chord hasn't arrived yet. So that's a good example of anticipation. So we're playing that minor third over the major chord, but kind of that phrase belongs to the next chord, even though that chord hasn't been played yet. But that's how we hear music. And that's another one of those things that the theory book can't explain. And if they try to explain it, sometimes they explain it wrong. They will say that, oh, that E flat is a sharp nine over the C, but it belongs to the F, because then it goes back. And they're playing a major seven of the F. Shouldn't work. But it works because 
again, it belongs to the next chord. Then another example of this, how you can outline these chords. This is also a tune that you have to play as a regular blues, not a jazz blues, I don't think it would work. Next up is Chitlin's Concarne. A lot of people have made videos about this tune. This is a great beginner's jazz tune, if not the best. Because I think in the solo, Kenny Burrell is only using the pentatonic scale. It's not playing anything else, I think. And uh, so it's easy to kind of transcribe. It's pretty straightforward. And But again, it's he's playing with a jazz feel. He's not playing like Eric Clapton or Jeff Beck. But this is great for teaching. <laughs> the melody, throw in the chords. I think he's actually playing this. So it's a C7 sharp 9, like a Hendrix chord, with, with a fifth. It's an interesting chord. Here again, it's very loose, the kind of feel. It's somewhere in between swung and even... You can kind of make it swing sometimes and play it more even and kind of stretch the time. That's a really good tune for experimenting with that. I think also that uh, Steve Ray Vaughan recorded this tune, so this can be a good segue for somebody who's coming from a blues to a jazz world. So that whole album with Kenny Burrell is amazing for learning jazz. And again, if you're a seasoned player, to, just to play along with that, to remember where you know, where you started with all this stuff. One last, and then maybe we'll do one more. But uh, on the PDF that I made for my patrons, but again, I want you to learn these heads by ear and just use these uh, PDFs to as a something to remember the tunes and also for teaching. But again, I want you to bring in the tunes and teach them by ear. Some of these are harder than others, but this one. If the student knows a pentatonic scale, they should be able to learn that melody by ear. This la last one is another shuffle, and it's another blues artist. It's T-Bone Shuffle. So now we're really getting into blues territory. Maybe I'll play something like... Uh, Thank you. 
So you see, you can play kind of Benson stuff over this too. There's no, there's a kind of a fine line between where it's blues and where it's jazz. Some jazz musicians would never play blues shuffle. In, like, it's not what they do. But then if you, again, if you take someone like Joe DeFrancesco or George Benson, or Jimmy Smith, that, that's, they're all about that. But uh, I love playing a blues blues. There are so many tunes like this. I have a playlist. There are more tunes with George Benson. Rodney Jones is another guitar player that has a lot of tunes like that. Bill Jennings, Herb Ellis. Wes Montgomery has a lot of tunes like this. That's all. That's a lesson in and of itself. Maybe I'll make a lesson about the kind of blues that Wes Montgomery plays. But I think there are so many people that know that better than I do. So, But uh, there are tons of like missile blues. There's also a lot of other blueses like this by Grant Green. So please let me know in the comments if you have a favorite Grant Green or Kenny Burrell or any other blues that you think I'm forgetting here. Then there are tunes that are kind of bluesy, but not really a blues form. But another tune I want to mention is Bag's Groove by Milt Jackson. It's also recorded by Kenny Burrell. That's a, also a very pentatonic melody right in the original recording it happens a lot of more there is a counter melody and there's a a harmony but there's also like a counter melody and there's a shout chorus type melody here you also have this some people play it that kind of a flat nine there which is weird so the another thing about learning how to play like this is the ability to use kind of ornamentation and the double stops, right? So what is that, you ask? Well, the secret is in those recordings. I know that's a lazy way of teaching, but it really, the secrets, the answer to that question are on those recordings. You have to kind of figure out what George Benson and Kenny Burrell are doing. I spent a lot of time trying to kind of really try to figure out what just, especially George Benson. So Bag's Groove just uh, is another really good uh, beginner tune, even though you could make an advanced version of it too, but for somebody who's new that is just pentatonic. There's a really interesting video with Pat Metheny and Joe DiOrio playing this tune that I found from Musicians Institute online. And uh, that goes to show that players like that like to play these tunes as well. So yeah, please let me know if you have a favorite tune like this that I'm forgetting. And uh, things that I'm not covering here are minor blues. This was kind of major blues. And then uh, I wasn't talking about West Montgomery. So there's a whole bunch there you can look at. So where do you go from here? You can watch my video on jazz blues where I talk about scales and stuff like that. And I also go over some other heads there if you, this wasn't enough for you. And then also I have a video called Use the Blues over the tune G Baby Ain't I Good Enough For You is that what it's called? And that's another, it's not really a blues tune, but it's I'm talking about how to use the blues over a tune like that in that video. So, and I also have a video from way back called Shout Chorus Playing that nobody watched, but I think the stuff I'm talking about there is very relevant. It's kind of uh, related to this stuff. So that was a lot of information. These PDFs on my Patreon page. And uh, as always, I wanna thank you for your time and attention and I shall see you next.